What is up? This is Jim Ellie with Reactive Training Systems. And in today's video, we're going to be talking about the fundamentals of program design using a bottom up framework, such as emerging strategies. If you've never heard of emerging strategies before, I highly recommend that you take a look at our, our intro to, to emerging strategies YouTube video linked up here. And if you've never heard of bottom up training, then effectively it's starting with the athlete first. And when you start with the athlete first, you need to know the fundamentals of program design, but specifically catered to the individual. What are we supposed to pay attention to when building programming and training for the individual? So in this video, you're gonna learn from Coach Mike Dushier as he shares the fundamentals of program design within emerging strategies. By the way, stay tuned until the end as there is a surprise bonus part of this course. Um, there's a Q&A towards the end as well as an announcement for you, some more free stuff and more educational material. So if you like this, uh, make sure you click subscribe, share this to your friends and enjoy. So I'm going to take a couple minutes, go over uh, today's plan, and um, just kind of share with you guys what the what the agenda is for today. We're going to be talking about fundamentals of program design, obviously uh, going over some principles uh, as I see them. And um, then we're going to talk emerging strategies. We're going to talk about RTS Classroom. And we've got a 15, 20-minute Q&A block at the end. Um, so if you guys have any questions, there's a Q&A section in the Zoom uh, in the Zoom interface that you can use for asking your questions, and that'll make sure that they don't get get buried in the chat. Uh, so if you got any questions, feel free to send them in there. Uh, John's going to be hanging out, keeping track of all that, and uh, he'll help help me sort through uh, whatever questions we've got. If you ask a question and we don't get to it during our time today, we will get to it. Uh, we'll get you an answer on that, you know, at some point as soon as we can. Um, you know, don't want to, you know, not answer a question just because of time limitations. So, like, like we mentioned kind of before we got started, this is a little bit of a different format for us. And uh, being in an online environment, there's a little bit of a question of, of like, who's in the room, you know? So. First of all, if, if you don't know who I am, I'm Mike Tushier, uh, and that may seem like a, kind of a like a redundant thing to have to talk about oneself uh, when you guys sign up for the seminar. But I, I do know that there are a few people who uh, are here, you know, kind of on the recommendation of a friend and things like that. So um, I'm Mike Tushier. I started coaching powerlifting um, back in 2004 or so. Uh, coaching my university team, and um, I've been coaching pretty much ever since. Uh, started Reactive Training Systems in 2008. Uh, it started out just kind of as a, a, a way for me to share what I had been learning, um, but it's grown and grown, and now you know we have you know full-time coaching staff, and uh, we're taking lifters to world championships, and and kind of a, a neat little tagline that we've got is that we've coached, I think at last count, it was like 14 uh, IPF world record holders, uh, which is a really fun thing to say, I guess. But I think the more relevant thing, as you'll see here, is that we really care about individual progress and individual results. Um, national, national, uh, training teams, national training systems are designed to churn out champions and world record holders and things like that to the extent that they're able. Um, the thing that makes us different, I think, is that we're focused on getting the best results that we can for each individual person. And it's not so much about just churning out high level this or that. And I think if you if we do our job well, then you know we can have those high level results too. But it's a lot more important to people who, you know, maybe aren't at that point in their career yet, or maybe don't have the um, the raw materials to get to that level, or just aren't interested. 
So that's a little bit about who we are and what we're about. Uh, I had a question for you guys. So this is, um, I'm gonna send this poll question to everyone. Um, how comfortable are you writing training programs? Given that this is a, a seminar that's on training program design, there's a lot of different ways that we can take this, right? Like there are people who just aren't very comfortable at all. They, you know, completely rely on their coach all the way up to, I'm sure that we have some very experienced coaches that are here in attendance. So given the range, I wanted to kind of get an idea of who's in the room. Uh, and I'll try to speak to that a little bit. Um, and so it's looking like kind of, as I expected, most people are somewhat comfortable a uh, few that are not very comfortable, and, and I would say few that are very comfortable. Um, but that's great. That'll help me kind of know how to how to tailor uh, the the discussion today. So that's all the preamble that I wanted to get through. So let's go ahead and and get into it. Kind of for starters, I would say that something to keep in mind anytime that you're designing a program, you're not building an engine. It's more like you're growing a garden. And this is a, a, an idea, it, it seems to be really embedded in lifting culture, this, this notion of uh, kind of a mechanical mindset to training that you, know, you do a thing that it drives progress. That it, it feels like even from a coaching perspective that you know, when you write the training program that you're doing something, but you're not, <laughs> you're at best, you know, providing some conditions and biology is doing the rest. And that's got a lot more in common with growing a garden than it does turning a wrench on an, en on an engine. But that doesn't mean that we can't still do some cool stuff. So I was thinking about like this, <laughs> this garden analogy, you know, uh, I'm a meathead at heart. So that's the, it's the biggest pumpkin that we could grow. Right, like if you're <laughs> gonna take a meathead approach to growing a garden, it's like, I wanna grow the biggest vegetables possible. So we can still do some stuff like that, uh, even with the growing the garden type of mentality. Um, and I think that's, that's an important mentality to, to bring with us here. So um, how do we do that? How do we build a training program that's gonna yield a, a giant pumpkin? Well. That's where I think the uh, principles of program design come in. And I've got three main ones that I want to talk to you about uh, today. Uh, and I'm presenting them kind of in, in a format of complementary pairs. Uh, so shout to uh, Milan Jovanovic uh, for his concept of complementary pairs in, in training. That's at least how I encountered it. Uh, which I think is just a really smart way to think about it. Uh, it overcomes so much of the dichotomy if you just think about things as as these complementary pairs. So, you know, well, like, are you a high volume guy or a high intensity guy? Well, you can be both and both at different times and they're really on a continuum anyway. So um, anyway, so the three that I want to talk about are integration and derivation stress and recovery, and explore, exploit. There are more, there are lots more, and, and Malatin has written about these. And if you uh, do a Google for uh, complimentary training, you can come across his site uh, and read some of his material uh, that I think is, is a really good way to think about training. And um, yeah, so the way that we're gonna be talking about programs today is almost like a recipe of these three different complementary pairs. So things that you encounter like periodization models are kind of prepackaged recipes. Okay, so uh, it tells you what balance of stress and recovery to strike at different times and how to change that over time. Uh, it tells you to what extent should you explore, to what extent should you use the knowledge that you've gained from exploring and, and things like that. It makes a lot of the decisions for you. So let's go a little bit deeper into this. So the first one is integration and derivation. 
So I think this is kind of the, the uh, overarching principle behind specificity and variation. So specificity, most of you, I would imagine, are familiar with, uh, in particular, the said principles, specific adaptations to impose demands. This idea that you get better at the things that you practice. If you want to get better at squatting, then you squat. You don't ride a bike. And we can take that further and say that squatting will make you better at squatting more so than leg pressing will. And that's true. The other side of that is that there's variations that we know are helpful. There's variations that allow us to practice parts of skills. Uh, there's variations that uh, have different benefits uh, and costs. And putting these, we can put these together in creative ways. So the other side of specificity is variation. And as I was thinking about this, it's not just specificity and variation. It's integration and derivation. So if you think of doing the competition squat, really what you're practicing is the integrated skill. You're practicing all of it all at once. And if you do a lot of volume in the competition squat, you get the muscle hypertrophy in the specific places. That's the reason that specificity is relevant is that it's the integrated skill. But there's also utility in practicing derived skills. Uh, for us, we talk about uh, specific developmental exercises quite a lot and how we can use certain specific developmental exercises to, to work on a problem, say that you're having uh, problems maintaining your bottom position in the squat. You may do pause squats because the slowing down of the movement, the additional time in that bottom position gives you uh, a, additional time to practice. You know, well, is that specific or is it more of a variation? Well, I mean, that's why I don't like the specificity and variation nomenclature for something like that. It's specific for that component of the skill, but maybe it's less integrated. So if you have something like a pause squat, you're working on a component. You know, it's more of a derivative. Um, Defining specificity can also be something that's a bit difficult. Uh, this chart that I included here is uh, from uh, strongerbyscience.com, Greg Knuckles' uh, website, which is also really great. I put the link here uh, to the original article. The reason I included that is that it's a really cool breakdown of the factors affecting strength, the, the contributions of strength. Now, if you were to go through there, some of those are trainable, some of them are not. Now, if you train a 1RM squat, that's the integrated skill and you're bringing all those things all at once. Now, there may be some utility in breaking it up and training specifically parts of this at different times. So what's the combination? Well, if you're in doubt, err on the side of the specific. Uh, have a reason for your choices, but that doesn't mean that you need to be able to fully explain everything. I think People talk about this a lot, like, well, have a reason. There should be a reason for everything that you choose in a training program. Yes, but the reason might be, I want to see if this works. I think it'll work, but we haven't tried it. So I want to, I want to try it and see. Now, the more that you know about something like this chart or the, the more background knowledge that you have, the more educated the guest can be. But you're always testing in a real world scenario, you're always testing in a, in a dynamic environment where there may be interactions, there may be more going on than, than what your mental models suggest. So that's why you have to test it and see if it works in real life. You can also vary your selection. So just because you have a block that's extraordinarily high specificity doesn't mean that every block has to be very high specificity. Also, there's stress and recovery. So stress and recovery gives rise to a lot of different principles uh, that we think of when we're talking about uh, training program design. It gives rise to things like stress recovery adaptation cycles. Um, the, the idea that you, know, you would train and then rest for a certain number of days and then train it again. Um, the whole concept of overload and fatigue management, I think is, a derivative of stress and recovery. Um, I included a picture here of, 
of here in the top right of your screen, the general adaptation syndrome. Uh, this comes from Hans Selle's work. Um, I was thinking about this. This is classic stress recovery. Like if, if someone in the fitness world is talking about stress and recovery, they will paste a picture of this, this very thing and talk about general adaptation syndrome. Um, talk about alarm reaction, resistance, and exhaustion. More recently, I've heard people talk about how like, oh, this is such old science. Uh, adaptation science has moved far beyond Selly. And that's fine. That's, I don't think it's about that. I think what we're talking to uh, when we put something like this in a presentation as lifting coaches, as fitness people, uh, it's not about adaptation science. We're talking about an idea. This is the communication of an idea and an observation in the real world. This notion of, hey, you want to apply a stress to get a reaction, but not too much of a stress. It's a specific kind of dose response curve. And I'm fine if you, if someone wants to, uh, in my mind, nitpick, I guess, and say that, you know, this is not accurate or there's more, uh, there's more accurate ways of presenting a dose response curve. That's fine. I think that if you look at it as the idea that it represents, it communicates an essential truth about stress and recovery. And that's the important thing. So if we think about it, we want to apply a stressor and then recover from that stressor. We want to apply a stressor and then adapt. And again, that gives you stress recovery adaptation cycles that gives you overload and fatigue management. But the stressor, that's what you're talking about mostly when you're talking about program design. You want to know what exercises do I do? What volumes and intensities should I, should I program? What frequency should I program? There's a lot of focus on the stressor. The recovery is kind of the absence of those stressors. And that's how we think of stress recovery adaptation when it comes to program design. But there's so many different things that get bundled up into that stressor. There's so many different qualities. Uh, and I think that we lose a lot of the juice uh, for some of these different qualities. So for example, intensity. We now think of intensity as percent of one rep max, as if those things are synonymous. But I don't think that they are. I think that if we're talking about exercise science, then you have to very clearly define, mathematically define, the variables in order to test hypotheses and come up with some kind of proof, and that's fine. And in that case, defining intensity as percent of one rep max, uh, you know, hey, that is useful, okay? But from a pragmatic standpoint, from a holistic understanding of a training program standpoint, the intensity is the intensity of the stressor. It's the brightness of the light. It's the temperature of the sauna. It's the intensity of this stressful input. And does the heaviness of the loading encompass that? Yes, I think that that, especially for the way that powerlifters design training programs, 99% of the time, yeah, that's fine. But think of it as the intensity of the stimulus. And I think that that helps to add some clarity to what it is that you're doing. And Similarly, volume is the quantity of the work. It's not just the tonnage. It's not just the number of working sets. It's not limited to any of those things. Uh, it's, it's the quantity of work that you're doing. It's the duration of light exposure. It's the, the number that the volume knob is turned up to on your stereo. And it's more than just tonnage. It's more than just working sets. Uh, for example, you know, what if you were to uh, push as hard as you could on an immovable object for three hours? That's only one working set. There's no tonnage. There's no number of lifts. Would there be any training effect from that? I mean, 
there would at least be fatigue, right? There's some stimulus there. Uh, the quantification does not fully define what's what's going on. You know, our our interest in the phenomenon is not adequately described by the the formulas in use today, and they may not ever be fully uh, fully described by those formulas. But that's not the point. You can use those formulas, and they're very useful. But don't mistake the map for the territory. And uh, the third one I want to talk about here is is frequency, and that's basically our ratio of stress to recovery. Uh, how often is a motor quality, a, a muscle group, um, a skill? How often are those things trained? How much recovery time do they need? How much recovery time do they get? And you can think about it from the perspective of different tissues as well, and and even body systems. You know, there's muscle groups, there's connective tissue, bones, um, but then also energy systems. Uh, there's your heart and lungs are taxed uh, by training, and that's something that we often don't give much thought to because it's often not a limiting factor. But in some of these edge cases, it can be a limiting factor. And then there are the less measurable qualities that affect the quality of the stressor. Things like your intention, uh, your focus, the difficulty of the set or the session, uh, the amplitude of movement and things like that. Just because they're less measurable doesn't mean that they're unimportant. So how do I distill this down into some practical advice? You're designing a program. You need to de decide this balance between stress and recovery, not only the volume and frequency, but the, the qualitative nature of that stressor, okay? So how do you figure this out? This is, it's simultaneously difficult and a lot of fun. Because there are a lot of roads that lead to Rome here. There are a lot of ways that you can construct an effective training program. And I would very strongly encourage you to study successful programs. Study old programs that are still in use. Uh, classic Dr. Squat programs, Candido programs. I, I listed a bunch of just kind of whatever came to mind for 30 seconds. Study top athletes. Um, if you go to Google Powerlifting to win, um, there, I don't know if, if there have been any updates to it recently, but for a while there were uh, lots of programs that had analyses done on them, uh, analyses comparing the program to these, uh, not these specific foundational principles, but a number of foundational principles. And it was evaluating the programs based on those principles. And I think that is a really interesting way to, to go about it. Not so much because of the analysis, not because you know this website says this is a good program or not, but it's it shows that the author of these things is thinking it through. He's saying, this program has these features and here's how they stack up to what I know. And I think that's a really great way to go about it. As you study these programs, take note of how do they apply stressors? What qualities of stressors do they apply? And what's the stress and recovery balance look like? And you can use that to inform your own training experiments. Uh, and we'll get to that a little bit on the next point uh, for explore and exploit. Um, but as always, something I say all the time is follow the trail of athlete response. If you do something and it makes you better, then that's key information for you. And you're going to want to take note of that. You don't need permission for these things. If you try something and it's counter to the typical way of constructing training and it works, you don't need permission to continue exploring that territory. You might need courage, but you don't need permission. So exploring and exploiting, um, this balance, I think, acknowledges individual differences. So imagine that you're, you've got this map, right? And you've done some training and it's kind of, uh, you guys can see my mouse, right? Okay, so you've done some training and it's like right in this area. You haven't tried a lot of really weird stuff, but it's all been pretty, pretty vanilla. So 
as you explore new territory, uh, you don't know if high intensity training works for you or not. You don't know if trying lots of variations and, and seldom deadlifting works for you or not. But as you move in those directions, you'll learn, hey, I tried a little bit higher intensity and that was good. Maybe I'll push that a little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit further. So as you explore new territory, it will either, it, it's going to tell you something about your response. And that will be either uh, uh, a catalyst for you to continue exploring or it's going to push you the other direction and, and tell you, hey, try something else. So how we structure this in emerging strategies is very uh, explicitly. We'll have blocks of training that are designated exploration blocks. These are a group of ideas, maybe not the whole program, but there are several ideas in this program that we have not tried before. So we'll try it and then catalog our results. We think this, you know, we, we know that, we know what the results were. You know, your performance improved by uh, X amount. Uh, or didn't, we think the results were uh, attributed to whatever component of that program we think worked. And then we can continue exploring that territory. And over time, we develop more and more certainty over what it is that is actually providing the result. Then when we get to uh, competition time uh, or you know, some period of time that's closer to uh, we want a reliable high performance. We use all that knowledge that we've accumulated about the individual response, and we build a training program that capitalizes on that. Um, the story that I use that highlights this kind of in the most dramatic way is uh, when I was coaching Brett Gibbs for the 2018 uh, World. In the lead up to that, we noticed that his deadlift was really responding best to low intensities and didn't respond that great to high intensity. So in the lead up to that competition, we placed the most effective training closest to the competition. So going to the world championship, we're doing the lowest average intensity training that we had done you know, in the several months leading up to that. And it worked fantastically. He uh, was the lightest, or excuse me, the heaviest lifter in the IPF to total 10 times body weight and uh, set a bunch of world records. It was just a, a fantastic day. Um, that's the training leading up to that is kind of the opposite of what you would expect if you were uh, thinking about training from you know a, a traditionally planned approach. Intensity is supposed to rise as you get closer to competition, but if that's not what the athlete's responding to, you'd be silly to do that. Um, and you should also construct your system so that you can see what the athletes are responding to very clearly. So practical takeaways for this, when you're in explore mode, make sure that you're paying attention, uh, make sure that you're keeping detailed records, minimize the noise if you can, so minimize uh, disruptions to training, you know, I mean, that kind of goes without saying, and, and to some extent, that may be outside of control. Uh, you may not want to do a really hard cutting cycle or something like that uh, while you're doing an exploring uh, phase. Um, sometimes that can't be avoided though. So uh, make sure that you're paying attention to what variables are in play and don't ignore the qualitative experience of the, of the athlete. They can tell you things about their experience that you cannot see just based on training log numbers alone. And then when it's time to exploit this information that you've gathered about individual response, make sure that you're thinking probabilistically. Think, you know, let's say it's time to choose uh, a special development exercise for the squat and you're considering pause squats. So when you look back at your block reviews, you've noticed that you've done them four times, three times have been a a great response and then one time was not so great. That seems like a, a pretty good probability that the pause squat's doing something that, doing something well, something that you want it to do. It's not a guarantee. You're not looking for guarantees. There won't be guarantees. There are never guarantees. 
but think of it probabilistically, what is most likely to have a positive effect. And you can use the whole of your exploration, the whole of your uh, training log to help inform those decisions. So again, periodization is your recipe. So we, we cover all these balances. You gotta strike all these balances. And, and these are just three, you know? So periodization helps make a lot of those decisions for you. It says, well, early in the training, you want to focus more on derivations, lower specificity, higher volumes. And then as the training progresses, then you increase the intensity and you reduce the volume and you select more specific things. That's a recipe for how to construct this thing. It's, it can be usually right. And I would say that in our experience doing this, more often than not, we arrive at conclusions that are not terribly far off from uh, conclusions that you would arrive at using a traditional periodized model. But good models are usually true, but none are always true. And I can promise you that if you're one of those athletes that has an atypical response, that's gonna be really important for you to know. And further, I can tell you that I don't know any athlete that has responded typically to everything. There's always something, some little nuance that if we can optimize it, things are a little bit better. A periodized structure imposes this top-down planning approach in every instance that I can think of. And to me, that ends up selling flexibility for comfort. We don't have to think about what comes next as much. We don't have to think about athlete response as much. And we don't have to deal with the uncomfortability of doing something unorthodox because we can just lean on this top-down planning structure. And I get it, but I think the alternative approach is to allow that structure to emerge from the short-term structure. So as you start planning your training, first you focus on the short-term. How do we get you the best results that we can from session to session or from week to week, and then allow that longer-term planning structure to emerge from that? Maybe it ends up looking a lot like a traditionally periodized plan. Maybe it doesn't. But at that point, you, you know that what you've arrived at is, if not an optimal solution, it's an ideal solution for that individual. So I wanted to talk to you for a second about emerging strategies and our approach to bottom-up planning and individualization, how it relates to these principles. Now we've put up a lot of information on emerging strategies at this point on our YouTube channel, um, but I'll just kind of try to summarize it as briefly as I can. <laughs> um, so you want to start with a really great training week. Design the best training week that you can in a self-contained way. And repeat that each week and, and monitor your results. And what you'll notice is that you may have an initial dip in performance, you may not, but you're going to respond to this, to this training. And you don't need things to shift and change up in every session and that things are going to get better for a while. And at some point you're going to reach a peak condition. So you start with a really great training week and you repeat it over and over and over monitoring your results until you reach a peak condition. Once you reach that peak condition, you go into a pivot block uh, and then you repeat with a new development block. You want to take careful notes of the process and uh, monitor how long does it take you to peak, what types of training, what types of development blocks lead to the best responses. And then when it's time to peak for your competition, you utilize all this information, all this knowledge that you've gained about your individual response, and you bring that into your planning for the last one or two blocks prior to competing. I think the next part of this is the Q&A. So yeah. uh, we've received um, 65 questions and counting, uh, which is awesome. Thank you all for sending in your questions. There's some really great stuff here. Um, obviously, we probably won't be able to get through all of these today, but we'll start um, going through some, um, answering what we can today. And uh, the ones that we can't get to, uh, we're going to record some videos and put it out there for all of you. Um, and we'll have a lot, a lot to answer. So. 
first one, um, this is a good one. So uh, the person had a question, Mike, um, do you think implementing emerging strategies for a teenage lifter is useful or is it a bit too early for this kind of programming for them? I think it's definitely useful. Um, so there's no real kind of programming that is inherently emerging strategies or not, except for the fact that it needs to not change more than is necessary. You know, so if you believe that a beginner should train all on one foot, then you could do that in an emerging strategies framework. Um, so whatever the whatever your beliefs are about kind of a, a novice uh, teenager training uh, situation, you can still do that in an emerging strategies framework. And I would say that's going to give you more information uh, about what you're going to need whenever you do hit those inevitable roadblocks. Great, Mike. Um, so another question that came in, um, more about the stress index topic, uh, you kind of mentioned it briefly today, um, but do we differentiate between stress index of a highly specific competition exercise and those coming from the assistance or supplemental exercises? And if so, how do we do that? So current models that, that we're using for stress index, so a little bit of background. Um, in the classrooms, we'll teach you all about stress index, uh, what it is, how it's calculated, and how to use it, things like that. In short, it's a calculation that we can run that is supposed to give us some information about like, generally the recovery demand of, of a training intervention. So if I'm comparing two different training protocols, one has a stress index of three, the other has a stress index of four, I know the stress index of four is gonna be more difficult, a little harder to recover from than the three. So like any tools, it's definitely got its limitations. Um, I don't think, it does not differentiate between competition exercises and uh, developmental or preparatory exercises or anything like that. Uh, I don't think that's a huge problem in most scenarios that you're faced with. Now, quarantine season has uh, shown me some limitations of that, like, I had on my Instagram of me doing a lot of isometrics lately, just pushing against immovable toe straps and things like that. How do you calculate stress index for that? Well, that's been a bit of an adventure. So it's shown me some of the operational limits to that, but I would say that in most of our normal training circumstances, it's still close enough to reality to be useful. That's great, Mike. Um, can you talk a little bit about pivot weeks and what the purpose of a pivot week is and what it does? Sure. There are five. For now, think of a pivot as a, a kind of deload. It's kind of a specialized deload. Now, there's a lot more that we can get into it, you know, whole lessons and whatnot, but there's five general goals to a pivot. Uh, a pivot should reduce fatigue. It should restore your sensitivity to training. It should uh, maintain your strength. And those are probably the big three. It should also help promote durability a little bit uh, to the extent that we're able to do that. And it should develop your energy systems uh, to some extent because that's probably a thing that gets neglected. That's like a quality of life thing, I think, that gets neglected a lot of times in normal powerlifting training and uh, pivot is a rational place to include it. Um, the training is by definition a little bit less than what you would see in a development block, um, but balancing the recovery from stress, uh, restoring sensitivity to training, and also at the same time maintaining your strength, that's what makes the pivot. If you can do those things well, then that pivot's gonna be awesome and your next development cycle is gonna be more likely to succeed. It can be a little bit complicated to do. Uh, and just to throw out there briefly in, in, in practical uh, terms, for starters, the pivot tends to be about a third the length of the development block. So if your development block was six weeks, your pivot should be about two weeks to start. 
and then you can individualize from there. This one is for Jim. Um, should creatine intake change or be adjusted according to caloric intake um, during uh, training? Uh, no, creatine intake is going to be dependent on your, your body weight, but for the most part, most people kind of fit into the category of taking five grams a day pretty much every day for the rest of your life. So if you're signed up for powerlifting, that's a, a burden that you're going to have to take on <laughs> for yourself. Um, there is going to be some bloating that can happen with creatine, and usually that's temporary. Uh, if you've never taken creatine before, there is likely to be an increase in, in water retention. That's how creatine works. It stores more water within your muscle fibers, uh, which allows you to create more ATP, uh, adenosine triphosphate. So if you have never taken it before and you're worried that you're going to get fat or something, uh, that's not how it works. It's actually more, more weight that is usually extra or intracellular, intracellular, can't say that word, within the muscle fiber. So you should notice that the bloat is actually looking more jacked. Uh, common misunderstanding about how creatine works. Thank you, Jim. Um, Ross, this one's for you. Do you practice meditation? And if yes, what kind? Um, yes, I do practice meditation. Uh, what kind? Well, I mean, that's uh, all over the place. It really depends on what my need is in that moment. Um, I think there's a lot of different types and forms of meditation. Um, from, a, from, a, from a training for like lifter standpoint, I think there's a couple of more specific ones. Um, one is first, I think, understanding the intent and purpose of meditation and mindfulness is the, like a lot of people have this misconception about meditation supposed to being like this Zen like moment where you shut off all thoughts and nothing is in your free and empty. No, that's not, that's not the case. Um, your, your brain is going to want to wander more than you have the ability to turn it off. And so part of that mindfulness training is to acknowledge when your mind leaves the present moment, when you're meditating and whatever you're, specifically trying to meditate on say it's visualization for a training session or a meet and your mind wanders from that thinking about oh i got a bunch of work to get done later you acknowledge that your mind left the present moment let that thought pass by and come back to the present moment and that's important because you want to be able to be present in, in the moment that you're in whether it be in the meditation or when you're at work or when you're at a meet or when you're training you want to be able to be present within that moment and you're going to be able to have a more effective moment when you're present in it whether it be for the training session for the meet you want to be able to pull yourself back to that present moment and so that's that's the that's probably the biggest one of mindfulness training that i think a lot of people misunderstand is that it's not so much to, to become a Buddhist monk as it is to just be able to recognize when your mind is drifting from where you want it and need to be from a productivity standpoint. And Mike, this one is for you. Um, if I'm new to planning programs in a specific sport, is it okay, quote unquote, to copy the logic of other successful programs since I don't have a lot of knowledge to properly analyze? I mean, I I think so. I mean, I still like one of my favorite things to do from a training standpoint is to look at training from other successful coaches or, or lifters and see what, what is it that I can learn from this? How can, can I better understand what, what are they doing that's making this successful? And is there something that I can take from it? So, uh, a few years ago, we got into this, we got on this kick where a lot of our lifters uh, were doing uh, six second eccentrics uh, for basically everything. Like it, an entire block is six second eccentrics. And we're fortunate to work with a lot of high level lifters. So it, it's looking like, hey, slow eccentrics are taking over the IPF at that point. Um, but what that was is I, revisited uh, triphasic training. And I was kind of asking myself, like, what can I take from this? And, and I thought, well, you know, we don't really do 
eccentric emphasis training very much. So I wonder if, uh, what would happen if we planned a block around it, you know, and so we did. And some people responded great. Some people responded just so-so. I don't think I had anybody that just did terribly on it. Um, but yeah, it, it's not a thing that I use all the time, but it's another tool in the toolbox. And I think that that's a perfectly rational way of going about it. If you're programming for a new sport, then, I mean, how else are you supposed to figure it out? Like you have to figure it out from basic principles all, all again. Like most of that work has already been done and it just seems reasonable to me to learn from the people who came before. And I suppose as a follow-up to that, um, <clears throat> From your time using emerging strategies, Mike, um, with your athletes and also coaching coaches to use it with athletes, how has it changed your approach to programming? And do you see different results for higher volumes, higher intensities, et cetera? I mean, it, we joke on, on our team that emerging strategies has kind of pervaded everything that we do. <laughs> it's just this idea of, uh, you know, just explore some territory, collect the information, and then, you know, follow the trail of what got you the results that you wanted. Um, that's pretty ubiquitous, so it's changed a lot. But um, most of the time, you, most of the time you land on a training intervention that's not terribly different from what you would have come up with if you had just followed a say a traditional periodization model or something like that now when i say most of the time i don't mean 90 percent of the time i don't mean 70 percent of the time i mean probably a little more than half the time maybe 50 60 percent of the time yeah you land you land on something that's um, pretty predictable i guess but it's not insignificant the number of people who need something that's quite different or who respond to something that's quite different they just don't respond well to very high intensities or very low intensities or something. You know, there will be some maybe part of a normal training approach that they just don't respond well to. And in particular, the some of these things are easier to track than others, you know, but I think having a system that allows you to distill it uh, and it's easier to know what to do with the information once you have it. It's the actual collecting of the information that I think is the hard part. Um, one last question. Um, so Mike, when uh, you're thinking about time to peak and you're thinking about um, helping an athlete to reach a peak condition, how do you go about measuring that? What are the things that you're looking for? What are the telltale signs that an athlete has reached a peak condition? Um, and how does that kind of inform your decision making moving forward? For the most part, we're looking at their estimated 1RM. And that, since again, since this is a stimulus that repeats every week, it can be fairly stable. So estimated 1RM, we're gonna track it each exposure and monitor the results. There will be some, assuming the block isn't just a total failure, there will be some response. You know, it may happen from the beginning of the block or it may take a little, a few weeks in order for the momentum to build. Uh, but there will be some response. And once that response starts, you're just monitoring it. And when it, when it peaks, then you end that block. Now, the very first time that you go through this, you may want to look for two successful, uh, successful, two successive weeks of negative performance. Like, so two weeks in a row where there's a performance dip or whether it's where it's subpar or something like that, just to make sure that it's not kind of a false peak. Because occasionally you'll have just one week that's off and then you'll get back to progression after that. So the first time through, make sure that you're taking it far enough to see the actual peak condition. Uh, but then after that, it, that number of exposures stays fairly stable as long as you're doing um, as long as you're keeping the training variables in the neighborhood, you know? So if you all of a sudden double your stress 
uh, or dramatically change frequency or something like that, yeah, that may affect your time to peak. Uh, but for the most part, uh, most part, that's not going to be a problem. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video, then we have a bonus lesson from RTS Classroom Emerging Strategies Case Studies. This video is available in the link below and it highlights RTS lifter Brett Gibbs and his journey from IPF World 2017 all the way to IPF World 2018 where he became the first lifter to total 10 times body weight at IPF Worlds. Coach Mike Tushier breaks down everything about his journey, the coaching decisions that he made that led him to becoming IPF World Champion, breaking four IPF World Records and ultimately having the most satisfying competition of his life. If you're interested in this RTS Classroom bonus lesson, click the link in the description below and I'll talk to you in the next one. Wait a minute. So we're going to do some training and we're going to keep doing it until it stops working and then we'll transition and do something else. Yeah, that's basically it. It's not a training system as much as it's a, an epistemological system. It's a way of interacting with the world and, and understanding how things work. I was always interested in tinkering with my training. I'm not sure that I would have wanted a coach to tell me what to do exactly. I like tinkering, and even now I like the tinkering process of it. And I thought, what am I doing to help those people? It can give you a process for coming up with the best creative solutions for an individual lifter and program for yourself and, and pay attention to your own training. I think it's a great way to understand a lot of that stuff and hopefully get to where you can build it yourself and speed up that whole learning process.